All right, well, it's uh, just crawling up on six o'clock now, so we, we shall begin. Um, good, good evening, everyone. I am Dr. Patrick Sullivan, superintendent of Cohasa Public Schools. I should say very proud superintendent of Cohasa Public Schools. Um, we, you know, are here to talk today about the re-entry re roadmap and um, the, the draft of the re-entry roadmap that was sent out to families on July 24th. I want to just assert right at the beginning the, the really importance of um, safety in everything we do. You know, I always say that our most important function as educators is, is really not educating, it's, it's first and primarily safety. Your students really can't learn unless we're in a safe environment uh, and a safe culture. And uh, I also want to um, just talk a little bit about the purpose of the meeting. The purpose of the meeting today is to gain input from, from families regarding our draft so that we can move forward and that we can create a more finalized draft that we put out to you. And I'll talk a little bit about timeline in a second. But I'm really honored to be here with uh, three amazing leaders who are, um, are with us today, and I'm gonna introduce them and you guys can just give a wave. But we have, uh, first of all, uh, Dr. Leslie Scollins. I think um, I think Tara is on, on our screen, but maybe she should not be. Um, Tara, if you're, you're, you're a panelist, so you shouldn't be on this for, per se. I think she's confused about it. <laughs> Assistant principal noise is here, but you shouldn't be on there. There you go. All right, <laughs> that, that's fine. Hey, this is live television. This is what happens, right? Playing without a net. Um, but I'm here with uh, three three amazing leaders. First of all, I have uh, Dr. Leslie Scollins, who is our assistant superintendent. I have Barbara Sawanka. Barbara is our new director of student services. Um, so happy to have you here with us, Barbara. Barbara's already done some great work in the short time she's been here. Uh, I, it is unfortunate that I'm introducing Barbara to folks in the Zoom forum, not the most personal way to do it. And of course, you all know uh, Principal Brian Scott, who is going into the end of his first year, and I'm sure for him it seems like about six years, because I can understand it myself, but he's done a phenomenal job uh, leading his school community. And I do want to talk a little bit about the, the timeline for all of this. Uh, first of all, we, as you know, we have forums today. Um, tonight, we had a forum yesterday that was very well attended, uh, also attended uh, pretty fully on Facebook. We will have uh, a forum on uh, this week and then on Monday with our Osgood uh, parents. Uh, August 5th school committee meeting will be uh, an opportunity for us to have the, the plan uh, as we have it at that point, voted on by uh, our school committee pending CTA approval. I think that's important that uh, it's noted that we're still in negotiations with our Coasa Teachers Association. Uh, August 10th, it is our plan at this point to be able to issue a, a finalized draft both to the state, that's when we're supposed to have it in, and to families. And what we'll be asking at that point is that families on that draft, if they would look at it and tell us, and we'll probably give a week to do so, uh, if based on what we're offering, and what we're proposing. And right now, of course, we're proposing to start in a hybrid model, uh, but whatever the model is at that point, that what we're proposing would lead you to do a few things, to either come back in the hybrid or to want to have your son or daughter or children be taught completely remotely. Or third, maybe you're in a situation where you've decided to homeschool your child. Um, we, of course, think we can, we're putting out a great a great product and obviously ruled by our safety rules and safety uh, guidelines that are set for us. But if indeed that's your decision, you know, we would respect that. We would like that information by the 17th because we really want to be able to uh, set our plan accordingly uh, as we move forward. Uh, I should say that um, bus routes, as I mentioned in the draft for students K to six outside of two miles uh, are, are being implemented. Uh, we're in a scenario where, based on the fact that we can only fit one student per seat in a 73-person bus, it's really equates to 26 students, that unless we're going to at least double, probably triple our bus fleet, which isn't feasible, uh, we are going to have to stick to the law in our transportation, which affords transportation for students in grades K through 6 who live outside of a two-mile radius. We'll talk a little bit about that um, more as we go forward. 
There's been some new information that has been uh, sent to us since our original draft of the roadmap came out. And I, ironically, it was sent like hours after I sent the draft out, but um, I did send that out in a supplement the following day. Included in that is some fall remote learning guidance and then the guidance for courses requiring further safety considerations. And that is uh, our courses such as phys ed, music, both band and chorus, visual arts, theater, and that will be incorporated in, a, in the next draft you see as well. Um, and uh, really, I, I anticipate that um, there, there was another uh, agreement that came out a couple of nights ago, which was a memorandum of uh, understanding between the MTA, the Massachusetts Teacher Association, and Commissioner Riley. And that provided educators uh, 10 additional days or 10 days before our students start I do anticipate that impacting our calendar. Uh, I will get that out to you as soon as I can. It is not my purview to approve calendar. It has to be done uh, by school committee. And of course we are in negotiations with the CTA. So that will all be settled out and hopefully, and it will at least be articulated at the Wednesday, um, next Wednesday's school committee meeting so they can take a vote on the calendar. And then I'll be able to get that information out to you. But I do anticipate that affecting our start date, which right now, of course, you know, is, set, is scheduled for students to be September 8th. So look for information on that coming. And I should mention that we, we are currently in negotiations with the Class of Teachers Association. And although there was input from many members of the association, as we discussed the issues and considerations within the plan, you probably saw the long list of folks who were involved and stakeholders who were involved. And I'm very proud of that because we did have a lot of stakeholders who were from families, uh, as we did students and then of course uh, staff, but that is not to be taken as actual negotiations. You know, we're in a unionized workforce and just like any unionized workforce, we do need to work with the CTA to bargain how uh, any plan we create impacts their negotiated responsibilities and negotiated working conditions. Those, so those talks are, ongo are ongoing. So without further ado, we're gonna begin the forum today, uh, just with some, kind of those, those beginning notes. And um, just to let you know how it will go is that I will um, do a brief overview along with Principal Scott regarding what we have planned. I won't go into absolute depth in everything that's in the plan. Obviously, it's a, a pretty comprehensive draft. So uh, a lot of the questions you have are probably answered in that, but I will attempt to answer questions after we present. We will have kind of a running list of, of questions. Um, and I will answer them as we go. We'll do our best to get to as many as we possibly can. I realize we won't exa exhaust all of the questions. Um, this, this is going to be streaming live. It's streaming live now on Zoom. It's streaming live on Facebook. Those of you who are on Facebook, if you want to ask a question, you would have to hop over to Zoom. I do apologize for folks last night. I wasn't aware we'd have so many folks. We've since expanded our capacity on Zoom. So anybody who wants to join up to about 3,000, and right now we're at 80 here on Zoom, so I think we're safe, can come on to Zoom and ask questions. Uh, and all I'd ask is that you write your question below on your screen where it says Q&A, that you write your question, and then I will we'll get to that and answer it. So without further ado, I'm going to start uh, with just a brief presentation. This is a, a Prezi presentation. Um, Dr. Scullins, can you see that OK? Okay, so just making sure you, know, you can see my screen. Yes, I can see it, thank you. Super, because I lost your faces on the screen when I go to it. Uh, this Prezi was created by our very talented uh, middle school principal, who's probably in the audience, uh, John Mills. So thank you, John, working with, with me. Um, just to start off, as uh, I mentioned, you know, we did put the draft out on the 24th, and our rationale for why right at this point we're suggesting a hybrid is because we did comprehensive what the commissioner was calling pressure tests. And the pressure tests asked us to look at um, all configurations within our school buildings <clears throat> at three foot distance between students, which is the minimum uh, that it's being uh, recommended by the, or required by the commissioner and his team, and at a six foot distance, which was, uh, which is really the ideal guidance, <clears throat> wearing mask that you're trying to set students uh, apart from one another. But, Three feet is what we're going at minimally. Six feet is what we're ideally trying to do. And we determined, <clears throat> excuse me, that we just couldn't do it with the numbers that we would be bringing back in a full course model. 
there was just no way we could safely fit the students um, in the rooms. We were unable to fit it at the elementary and at the middle and the high school, uh, which is of course what this forum's about, where the rooms are a bit more undersized than our elementary rooms, some of them, and they're, they're not of uniform size uh, either, that there were points where we could only fit uh, 12 desks safely at a six foot distance and we could, we really weren't going to be able to safely fit, um, for social distancing purposes, uh, the full crew in at a three foot distance. That was a major factor. Another factor was, of course, our buses. And um, although by law we don't have to transport anyone over sixth grade, even to transport our students at the elementary level, um, that who would who would want to take uh, a school bus and and then going on, we would have to double and maybe triple. Our, our bus fleet, which is just not feasible to be able to do that. So we've, um, excuse me, we've chosen a couple of hybrid models, uh, each of which has been designed for the individual learner. And the first is just, we're not reviewing this today, but just so you know, we determined that our elementary hybrid model would be a two cohort model. So there was an A cohort and a B cohort. Cohort A would be going to school on Monday and Tuesday in person and then would have remote learning Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And our cohort B would go Thursday and Friday and then would flip it and have their remote learning. And we, we have a, a good, good developing uh, sort of back and forth between synchronous and asynchronous remote learning help in that model. But the big, uh, between specialists and of course uh, core teachers. But a big concern there was we didn't want the distance and the gap thinking of a whole week where a student of, of, a, of a really young age who was developing basic skills was separate from um, their teacher. So we thought it was important to at least have them have contact uh, every week. Whereas at the secondary level, both the middle school and the high school, we felt that it would be um, more appropriate and uh, tied into the independent nature of the middle school, or in this case, high school student, to afford them a model that was set on a remote model. So we would plan for one big remote uh, unit or lesson, but that we would have times where we were meeting in person, where we would focus on the work that can best be done in person. And then we would have a continuance of that independent learning cycle where they would have uh, the week where they were doing remote. We felt very confident that that could, uh, that could be provided uh, best at the middle and the high school level. I should say all the school plans include uh, regulations around masks that are set for us by the state. These are not suggestions. These are absolute requirements. Masks are required for all students in grades two through 12. They're recommended for K through one, but they're not required. Um, and masks are required, not uh, face shields. Face shields, uh, there are some, we, the Department of Public Health says, they can be a mitigating factor and can help students who have medical reasons for, um, and there's a few other reasons for having to wear a face shield, but they're not prescribed as actual the requirement. It's, it is face masks. And of course, our staff will be wearing masks. And our staff who works um, more intensely with students one-on-one -on -one, uh, for longer durations will have further what's called personal protect, protective equipment or school safety supplies, which will involve um, materials such as gowns and face shields that would be able to uh, help them attenuate if they're closer than three feet to the safety protocols. All cleaning protocols are sanctioned by the um, Center for Disease Control, the CDC, they'll be followed. We'll have routines set and tracked daily for both touch point cleaning and deep cleaning at all of our buildings, including the high school. And then uh, I did mention this, but we are going to be asking uh, for you soon to tell us what plan is going to work best for you, whether it would be the need for a full remote or this hybrid plan. And I should say, you know, um, really, it's because of the great work of Cohasset and because the community is so connected and that our civic leaders were on top of this from an early point that our rates are, are rather low and we're able to even prov provide this model for us as I know a lot of our neighboring towns and towns around us uh, are not in a position to do this because of health factors. So uh, just moving back to our, um, to our model at the high school, I'm gonna turn it over to um, Principal Scott to kind of walk you through what we have planned right now in our hybrid at the high school. 
Principal Scott. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sullivan. So um, as folks know, the state has asked us to provide, you know, three models and asked us to be able to toggle between all three with minimal disruption. And in my mind, that's not really three models. That's one model that can do all three things with minimal disruption. And the most important things for us in building that were simplicity, accessibility, and flexibility. So what we're proposing is a one week in person, one week remote hybrid model and dividing students roughly in half to accommodate the three foot spacing requirements. So let's start with simplicity. Students need routine. And so we needed to create a model that kept the routine the same as much as possible. And the best way to do that is through the schedule. So in all three scenarios, we are gonna use the same schedule, modified a little bit. Uh, and we took the schedule that we had developed before the closure when we had agreed to go to uh, the later start. So we had already been kind of working on it. It's different than our uh, traditional schedule, but it's still, in, it's pretty close. It still includes a four period rotating block schedule, but it adds a daily, what we call utility period, which is this flex period that serves a variety of purposes, but is mostly geared towards academic tiered support and social development. And in our prior model, that was once a week, we, the faculty kind of agreed that the daily model serves the students better. And so that's the one we've adopted. You know, incidentally, a lot of schools in the South Shore are actually moving towards a block schedule because it, it serves their situation in this situation well by reducing the number of classes that have to meet daily. So fortunately we have that in place already. And you know, the students who are already high school students and our faculty uh, are familiar with it. But no matter what, in our proposed schedule, school starts every day at 815. And that's whether students are all in the building, whether they're all at home or whether they're in, in both locations, everyone is logging in at 815. Depending on whether we are in person, hybrid or remote, there are going to be relatively small adjustments. So for example, if we're fully in person, we're gonna relax arrival and dismissal times. We're gonna stagger when students are in the hall. We're gonna provide for them to spread out as much as possible using some alternative spaces for things like lunch. If we're entirely remote, the periods are gonna remain the same, but the lessons that are gonna be developed because the students are online, aren't gonna be a full 80 minutes. They're gonna be broken up, let's say into you know, 15 minutes of instruction, 15 minutes of work on their own, come back and use some breakout sessions uh, so that we, we kind of reduce that, that screen time, which, um, you know, if anybody's been using Zoom, it is, it really kind of takes its toll on you. So, so that's the first piece. The second is accessibility. Some students and some teachers will need to be able to access synchronous learning remotely, regardless of which of the three models we're in. So in order to accommodate that without creating two separate lesson plans for teachers and two different routines for students, we've proposed that everything be developed remotely, regardless of where people are accessing it from. So, you know, I'm gonna teach my English class and it will be delivered via Zoom or some kind of streaming solution. And depending on what that solution is, no matter where the student or teacher is, everyone can access it at the same timeline. Now, I might have a teacher in the room in full in-person learning with two students that have to access it remotely. I might have half my class in and half at home, or everybody might be at home. But because the development and the delivery method doesn't change and the schedule doesn't change, we kind of keep the simplicity and allow for a little bit greater accessibility for students. And I want to just touch a little bit on, on two more items. The first is grouping. So the main argument from the American Academy of Pediatrics for having students in the building is social development and well-being. And secondary is academics, although I think everyone would agree that in-person academics is where everybody wants to be. So ideally, I wanna bring the students in by grade level. You know, my last name is Scott, my best friend's last name is Casey. If we break by the alphabet, I'd never see it. Um, now, there are considerable challenges to that because if I have a class of 28, that class of 28 could have to span multiple rooms, which is gonna require supervision. So you might have a situation where if all of the freshmen are in, and you have a, an English class of 20, or let's say 24, 12 kids are in one room with the teacher, 12 kids are in the other, a couple of kids are home, and, you know, we're, we're Zooming everything and they might alternate which room the teacher sits in or the teacher might go back and forth a little bit, you know, during the lesson, but um, there are definitely some, some challenges to doing that, but I do believe it's in the best interest of the kids because they're gonna be around their friends. Um, if we're able to do that, we're gonna need some more information, but. 
you know, if it's possible, that's, that's what I want to do. The other is grading. We have to grade. You know, it was pretty clear um, last year, and there was consensus among our department heads that one of the biggest obstacles in the spring was the changing guidance, which meant changing student and family expectations, which is one of the worst things that we can do. And that's not a criticism of the state. It needed to happen. But we went from traditional school to enrichment to this credit, no credit thing, and it was very confusing. Um, so everyone kind of agreed that by developing a syllabus that plans for all three things and grading standards and, and lays it out from the outset that it would be very, that the expectations would be clear and certainly flexible, um, but much in a much better place than they were in the spring. Ryan, so if I could stop, stop Ryan, yeah. just for one sec. Um, sure. One good analogy I heard about the, uh, that I've, I use quite often is um, it came from uh, Peter DeWitt and the, he's an educational leader. The idea is that what we were in in the spring was pandemic learning, which was really uh, in crisis mode, you know, trying to plan for uh, multiple varieties of home situations um, without any preparation. And now we're really moving towards what I would say is properly termed remote learning. So I just, I think that's a really good way to look at it because now we do have time to plan a much more robust and connective model. So sorry about that, go ahead, Brian. No, no, I mean, that, that's basically most of it. I, I wanted to kind of keep it brief and keep it as an overview. There's a lot of details that we can't, uh, we're going to need to actually see how to operationalize this. Right now it's theoretical um, and it's not ideal and, and nothing we're going to do is ideal. But I, I do think that if we do it this way, we can create an environment that's consistent for families, that allows families for different circumstances, different options, uh, and that allows us to go kind of from one model to the other relatively seamlessly because you know, even though everybody hopes that, um, you know, there's a vaccine soon and, and everybody gets along with, you know, the way their lives used to be, we got to plan for the opposite. So we have to plan for, you know, um, a potential outbreak, a, a, a cluster, uh, and then what are we going to do? And I think, I think this allows at least enough consistency that it won't be as disruptive as what we underwent in the spring. Thank you, Brian. And obviously we'll, we'll take questions on all of that in just a moment. Um, I want to bring people's attention to our safety protocols now. In the interest of time, I'm not going to dive into all of these. I talked a little bit about masks, but you can see in the guide, we have um, safety protocols for everything that's on the board here, plus some. And um, <clears throat> we're taking cues from CDC, uh, taking cues from the uh, state, the Department of Education, of course. And we're taking all these protocols and operationalizing them within our school buildings. I just want you to be aware. Uh, of all of those safety protocols and that all of these are mentioned in the in the plan. The first six weeks, as I mentioned, <clears throat> the timeline may change for the first six weeks when we actually start school, um, more come on that, but our goals will not change. So our goals for the first six weeks are um, really to get everybody back in a way that enables the best learning to happen that's possible. And it has to take in mind that we, we, all of our students, no matter what age they are, have experienced a little bit of trauma to a great deal of trauma from being out that long and not being back. Some students will, um, just like in anything else, will, will come in more easily. Uh, other students will, will really have uh, hesitation coming into school because of the time that they've had away from school. And you know, one of the main reasons we're driving to have them back to school is because we recognize that the damage being away from school can have on students. You know, I have four kids of my own and I can see the effect on them. And I know that I'm, I'm sure I'm not alone when I say that uh, in the crowd watching now. Um, but we're going to establish safety and security in the first six weeks. We're gonna be in a different situation. We're gonna have students wearing masks, we're gonna have staff wearing masks, we're gonna have all kinds of new protocols. We have to go over those protocols and we have to link those protocols with the protocols we had before the pandemic to make sure that everything is seamless. We need some time for the training of staff for that. And we also need some time to train students on it. Uh, and all the while welcoming them back in social emotional ways. We need to let them reconnect with their fellow students and former teachers. For some students getting that closure with their last year teachers is important. Um, understand expectations in both remote learning and in-person learning. Really articulate that uh, at the beginning of the year and engage in discussions regarding social awareness. There's a lot clearly that's been happening on the social front regarding racial uh, unrest, 
uh, social, social injustice issues, uh, pandemic, all kinds of things that we really need to allow our students to voice, to have meaningful discussions, and allow our staff to have some training to be able to facilitate those, that open discourse. And then, of course, a focus on the social emotional learning, of, learning um, competencies of self-awareness and self-reflection. There's a lot our students in, uh, need to do to be able to self-reflect, to think about everything that's happened so they can move forward appropriately. And then finally, uh, just a quick note on, on social emotional. Uh, our, our, sc our schools at all levels are joyous places. Um, one of the things I was struck with when I came here a few years ago uh, as, a, as an educator was how really deeply connected our staff is with our students and how, how much of all of our school buildings are really community school buildings. And we need to keep the joy that's developed in those schools um, going and we need to figure out ways to do that with our new conditions. Our staff is amazing. We will figure out a way to do it. Um, but we need to take, take time to make that a priority. And then CASEL, which is the Collaborative of Academic, Social and Emotional Learning, has prescribed a, a re-entry plan that we're really gonna be working on with teachers. And you can see their main points that they think we should focus on, and I couldn't agree more with them. Um, a lot of that has to do with all, all about connectivity and providing safety and really looking at data uh, to help drive us uh, as we go through the first six weeks. And at the end of the first six weeks, even as we move towards the last two, we really need to be dipsticking to see how are things going? And a lot of that has to happen with the community as well. Um, the first six weeks has to bring you in. We have to be able to at least let you see what's happening in the school buildings. You have to be comfortable with that. And we're gonna look at ways to do that even before school starts um, in socially distanced and safe ways. Obviously our long range SEL planning, providing resources for families, whether it's learning resources or coping resources, and then providing that kind of training for our staff that's, that's so important. So essentially that's just an overview in kind of a nutshell. And let's see, how do we do Brian? 26 minutes, that's not too bad. Um, and now really the, the meat of it is to get to your questions. And uh, like I said, it's not gonna be an exhaustive uh, answering of them. You can certainly email me questions. I will get back to you as quickly as I can. Or if it's a special education question, you know, Barbara would be good to email to. And if it's a real building specific question, you know, Brian will be able to handle that for you too. Um, we're a busy crew, but this is an important thing. Um, so I'll just kind of look through the questions and, and kind of take them as they come. Uh, this is a, I read the draft. Uh, I am not sure why one lunch utility is 25 minutes and one is 34. And uh, Brian, I'm gonna let you answer this, but there's a suggestion here that says, I would suggest moving the extra nine minutes to a break between period two and period three. This way those online, those who are online can get up, stretch, get water, et cetera, between each session. And it will give more than the three minutes for others to move from period two to period three or to get a mass break. And before you answer that, Brian, I just want to mention that one of the reasons that this forum is timed the way it is is because we do have a fairly large grant at our disposal right now. That's the school reentry grant that equates to about $225 well, exactly $225 per student, which is, uh, I think for us, about $328,000. So we're really looking for the most efficient way to spend that money, working with school committee, of course. So all these suggestions help with that, and they also help with that planning. So Brian, I'll let you answer that question. So um, the schedule is rigid to a point, right? It, so everybody logs on at 8.15. If people log on at 8.17, no one's get chastised for being late to class. The, the lunch and utility, that, that's our original schedule as if the pandemic had never happened. And instead of monkeying around with it, I just left it as it was. But, you know, as we talked about bringing two grades in, this lunch utility, you know, flex hour was really just an hour. Um, and, you know, we'd have, let's say, you know, one grade take the first lunch while the other grades in utility and then flip them uh, and have, you know, the teachers alternate and I can use some of the ESPs uh, for lunch coverage and of course me and, and you know Miss Noyes would be on lunch coverage. You know moving the, the nine minutes here or there there's going to be a ton of breaks be, and everything is kind of weather and Zoom fatigue dependent. Um, it depends on all kinds of conditions. It's, it's how hot it is. It's you know how many kids are in the room versus how many kids are remote. You know if I get an AP French class of eight kids they might be all in the room 
almost all the time because it's not an issue. Um, so really, there's so many variables with, you know, hundreds of different classes that we're going to be really flexible, but, you know, get away from the mindset that it's, you know, at, at 8.15 we start and at, you know, 9 o'clock we're done and you have two minutes in the hallways and then, you know, whatever. Yeah, and our model, that's a good answer. And our model affords the most flexibility at the high school because of the age of our students. And, uh, and also that helps with our middle school model, which is a little different to a lot different at times. Um, for remote learning in the hybrid model, can you clarify that students will be able to view, attend the same classes that in-person students are attending via Zoom, i.e. they can participate in an actual live class via Zoom each day. Of course, we're still working some of this out, but I will let Brian answer from a planning perspective. Yeah, so think of it, think of it just like this meeting. You know, Pat's at school. I'm at my mother's house because the dog was barking. You know, I don't know where the other two are, but it looks like they're home. So we might be all in different locations, but if I'm the teacher or Pat's the teacher or whatever, everyone's getting the same instruction. I might, if I'm the teacher, have 12 kids in front of me that you can't see but on your screen, you know, and that won't change. So whether we're a week on, a week in person, or a week remote, it's going to look kind of the same. It's just the environment, the physical environment that you're in that's going to change. And that's why I, I kind of like it, um, because in a kid's mind, I'm getting up, I'm getting in, or I'm getting online, and, and that's the way it's going to work. Yeah, and there are a lot of elements in um, the plan, the, the, the roadmap, that have to be looked at from a policy lens. One of them is attendance, but clearly the attendance policy we're looking at is a, an active participation within the learning that's being offered. Uh, and that is a, uh, that's something that will have to be uh, really articulated by our school committee, but that, that's what Brian's talking about for sure. Yeah, and I'm not sure this matters so much to parents, but you know, we take daily attendance. So kids come in the building. If they're late, they check in the office. We're going to have to go no matter what we're into period attendance. You're either in class or you're not in class. Um, right. And that'll just be determined by who's on screen. Correct. Um, if we decide we are uncomfortable with the hybrid model, will we be permitted to opt for 100% remote? If we then at a point in the future decide it was safe and wanted to go from 100% remote to hybrid, may we do that? And then the converse of that. I'll just say right now that we're trying to get a good sense for what you might do the rest of the year. Um, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think you'll lock anybody into a particular model forever, but we're really asking that you think about um, what you're going to do um, for the year when you do suggest, when we do ask you for that. But um, yeah, there will be 100% remote, but I'll let Brian talk a little more about that. Yeah, so there's a lot of discussion in the media about, um, you know, you have to pick one and you have to stay and you can't get out for the semester. And to my mind, I don't understand that logic. So I would like to have a scenario where you can go in and out because everything is developed remotely. And I think the other schools are trying to do in-person stuff and then have like online academies with different teachers. So I think that's why they want people to pick one or the other. Here, I don't think you need to do it. So if I'm logging in, um, and, and it was my week on, but you know what? I'm not feeling great, but I'm not feeling bad enough that I can't go to school. I'm going to aim for remote. If for some reason I get diagnosed with, with COVID or I think I am and I'm spooked by it and I want to stay home for the rest of the month, great, fine. You know, we can, we can do that. And then you can jump back in to the hybrid model in person, you know, assuming you're fine. Um, and that it should be relatively seamless for that. So I, part of why we developed it this way was to give all kinds of different people with different scenarios, uh, options, you know, in terms of how often they're in the building and, and how to toggle in and out of that stuff. Because the reality is, you know, we might have, you know, a day that's super hot and we have to go all remote because, you know, it's just not tenable. Um, we might have, you know, an outbreak and the school has to close down because that's what the state says and, and we have to go all remote. And then all of a sudden the state turns around and said, there's a you know, vaccine and we're all back in person. I think we are, we're able to do that with this, you know, relatively seamlessly. Yeah, we've been asked to be, and I quote, nimble. And so we're, uh, I don't know if I, if Brian, if I'd say you and I are particularly nimble, but no, we're, no. we're, we're nimble in us, our man. minds. So we're going to be flexible with this. <laughs> uh, we have to be. Uh, do you anticipate, um, I'm sorry, can someone please speak to why it was decided to put 12th and 9th grade together? My daughter yes. will be in 12th grade this year and will not see any close friends in 11th grade. So, you know, there's, like I said, no plan is perfect. From a building administrator's perspective, putting ninth and 10th graders is a disaster. 
just you know, from a behavioral standpoint, from a cultural standpoint, 10th and 11th graders have been here. They know kind of the rules. The ninth graders haven't. They're not learning it from the sophomores. They will learn it from the seniors. And, and not in a like, you know, intimidating way. The seniors will set a very nice tone. They'll be on in kind of separate schedules, separate things. They won't cross paths. But the, the environment will be very nice. And then the 10th and 11th graders, there's a lot of mixed classes in there. So to have them in together makes some sense because if I got a chemistry class who's half sophomores and half juniors, I don't have to worry about necessarily, you know, splitting them off from one another. Um, and they're a little bit, you know, closer in terms of what they're, they're doing. So, you know, my feeling with grades was more kids have more friends in their grades than they don't. Um, but the alternative, like I said, would be you potentially have half your friends because, you know, we'd split it up in a different way. So yeah. again, it's not, it, nothing's ideal, but that was kind of the logic behind it. And, and I, I think as you, John, just go, you said, Brian, the, um, the fact that scheduling mostly flies in the, in the, uh, the way grades are formulated. Uh, it does make sense from a scheduling perspective, which I think is a real uh, paramount point there. Um, do you anticipate that some teachers will not be willing to teach in person? So the students who are in person learning one week will be in, or in a room on a laptop with a teacher teaching them on Zoom. That's possible. That is possible. Um, you know, we're still in uh, negotiations about what what is the situation about, um, you know, the, it says not willing, what, what exactly that means. We certainly want to respect and help our staff and, and do that in every way possible to create an environment that's best for everybody. Um, but, but I wouldn't count that out completely, you know, and I would say that um, it, it, we would obviously have to think of supervision. You know, we can't leave yeah. kids unsupervised anywhere, but, um, but that's a, uh, yeah, I wouldn't count it out totally. And the more likely reason is that it's not that people aren't willing. Everybody, in the, everybody wants, and they told me, would love to come back. Yeah. Um, some people are just so high risk medically that I don't, I am not comfortable having them in the building. Um, period. So if that's the case, but they're still able to work remotely. Now I think to Pat's, you know, suggestion that we get some people in, maybe that, maybe if we have, you know, let's say an English teacher, I'll use the English model again, that isn't able to do it at all. Maybe that substitute is more of a long-term sub type of thing so that we have, yep. um, you know, a teacher as opposed to um, just someone who can supervise the, the class. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's, those are things we're going to work through. And once we get a sense for how many students will be remote, that'll help us as well. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Principal Scott referenced, I'm sorry, Principal Scott referenced identifying or developing some streaming solution for remote learning. What does that mean? Um, does he mean to deliver the remote learning? Does that mean, I, I can't, does it mean to deliver the remote learning has not been finalized yet? If so, when will that get finalized and how and cost? So I guess the question mainly is around solutions for streaming and we are looking at them. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's a lot of talk about what technological tools we need and, you know, Zoom is fine, that'll work. Is it ideal? I don't know, and, and you know, what, what is the cost gonna be? How quickly can we implement it? How uh, much training do the teachers need? What the timing of this whole thing is, all are gonna determine whether or not we go in a different direction. So, you know, I guess that my point is, we're looking at a bunch of different options, um, and if there's a better way to do it, then we're gonna do it. But it's really, everything is so, you know, conditional on, um, on you know, 50 other things that I couldn't answer specifically what exactly you know, we were gonna, you know, we don't have it down to like, oh, we'll look at these three things. We're not even close to that yet. We are looking at streaming solutions though. Our um, CIO for the town has, has had some uh, contact with some companies that could, could possibly facilitate um, streaming better than what we're doing through Zoom. So it is in our minds and also potentially in our finances. Uh, I have a senior and a seventh and eighth grader. I know the middle school is splitting alphabetically and will be keeping siblings together. Will there be a plan to keep middle school and high school siblings in the same schedule? I don't think you could practically do it. And that's, that's a major drawback from doing it by, um, by grade level. So, you know, if that was enough of a concern for parents, like that's stuff that we want to hear because I would shift and, and, and accommodate people in that regard and go, go alphabetical. Yeah, that is, that is, I mean, again, the, the word draft, it, I, we meant that. Like we put what we think is best for kids. And, we, and I want you to know that like we, we did have a lot of thought behind it, but the, this is one of those areas that, you know, 
we're, we're listening. Um, I do think there is some real uh, rationale behind the grade level model, as I think you heard. And um, so it, it, it is a tough sell for me in some respects, but I absolutely see it from a parent's perspective. Um, and this would probably be a good time for me to just make sure everyone knows that none of these are, are the best solution. You know, I think we've proven that the best solution is for us to be face to face with the kids and then maybe to incorporate some of this as a learning supplement. So no one loves any of this. And I just had to say that um, because we don't. Uh, when will we find out what weeks our children will be doing in the in-person learning and when they'll be home? So that's well, nothing's coming, yeah. Yeah, nothing's been finalized yet. So, you know, again, we have to operationalize this whole thing. There's all kinds of stuff that has to go uh, into making this, this idea actually work. Um, and, and so that's one of the, the things that we're waiting on because it doesn't make sense to go and declare that this is gonna happen. And then all of a sudden something shifts and we're doing something different. You know, we're trying to get information out as, as fast as we can to families. You know, I have a daughter I haven't heard from my town yet. You know, I get it. Um, you know, we want people to be able to plan, but you know, until we finalize that this is actually where we're going, we can't actually do that yet. Yeah, and my goal, it's, it's going to be later than typical, of course, but you know, it would be before the end of August to get that out. Um, so people at least knew that. And honestly, as, as, as soon as I can possibly get that out to you um, with, in, in terms of our planning, and I did explain the timeline of, of our planning, uh, I will do. You know, we will, we will do that. And I know that's a tough one. I'm going through that as a, as a parent myself. Um, on the remote work week for the grade, will the teacher be in the classroom providing live streaming still, workshop model still? Concern to be having one full week away from the teacher and no direct instruction. Yeah, I know that goes back, I think, to the first or second question that it's going to look like this, whether you're in the building or not. Uh, the yep. teacher will, will be logging in. It's not like the teacher's in one week and then the teacher's off the next week, you know. Has there been any thought given to no need for snow days if we are on a hybrid teaching method? Oh, yeah. Yeah, we, we've thought about that a lot. Have I got official word that we can do that? No, I have not. But doesn't it make sense? It makes sense to me. So I, oh, I a remote day. Well, and uh, Brian did mention that, you know, we're going to be very conscious of things like heat index uh, where, because kids are wearing masks. And if we are in a situation where um, there's a heat index mentioned in the actual draft, and that's what I'll be following. And if it reaches a, a level that is untenable for our students or is anticipated to be untenable, uh, we will call a remote day because of safety reasons. Um, when will high school schedules be released so our students know what classes they are taking, especially for summer work? Yeah, I mean, we're still working on them. It's been, it's been brutal. And, and the, all I can say is the guidance department is working. You know, I'm, I'm, on, the, I'm on email with them at 10 o'clock at night you know, going through different scenarios and, um, you know, solving different problems. Um, you know, in terms of summer work, there really is only summer work for AP classes. So those teachers are aware that, that you know, if they haven't reached out and, and Ross is finalized, we're not going to have summer work. We're not certainly going to jam, you know, however many two weeks or six weeks worth into, um, you know, one week before school, that won't happen. And the reality is because of where, let's say like a pre-calculus class, left off what they would have done as a review of that pre-calc over the summer they have to teach in the fall so i wouldn't worry about you know the summer work um frankly the kids could still use a break and, and i'm okay with that but schedules will be out as soon as we get them um you know again we just need to you know button some stuff up and that's all in conjunction with the plan i would say you know uh, obviously we're talking a lot about social emotional things and safety because it, this is where we are but we are certainly attuned to um, the fact that if there was any slide at all, we need to assess that and need to, to pick up where we are. Our, our teachers are working on that before school ended. Um, you know, as you, as you might remember, we had a couple of professional development days. A lot of time was spent um, figuring out from a curricular standpoint where we might be short. And part of the six weeks um, is also determining where our students are so we can, we can make sure we, we're, we're ready to be flexible on that. How does lunch work? Um, will we be able to take breaks outside during designated times with friends? What does grading look like? Those are two, two major questions in one. Yeah. Uh, well, lunch <laughs> is easier. Um, so, you know, we, we took a tour of the cafeteria and it, you have those long tables. You can get like two kids at a table. Uh -huh. 
Oh. Right. So we got to get rid of the dims. Um, you know, we'll put in, you know, maybe student desks is one suggestion that that might make that work. But really, we want to kind of expand the space. We have courtyards, we have a backfield, you know, we have the, the senior lobby when the seniors aren't in. Uh, we have the lower lobby to a certain extent. So we want to kind of expand the campus and, and, and get kids outside uh, as much as we can. We're not going to have kids like get downtown and, and come back a, an hour later. Um, so it's not, you know, open campus as, as maybe traditionally understood. But it's going to be an expanded campus for sure, um, you know, providing that we can supervise it appropriately. Yeah, and we're going to be careful about cleaning protocols too. I want to make that clear. Like, high school is the only school that we're really allowing this type of flexibility with lunch. The other schools will be more, and that's another reason. Obviously, we share a cafeteria, so it, it, it does make sense um, for the high school to be more flexible. But we're going to be really mindful of where folks eat. And remember, they're really set ways for people to be able to eat because they they have to be six feet apart. They have to take off their mask. They have to be facing one direction. And as I was talking about the physical setup in one of the meetings, a high school student really, really did a great job in, in reminding me, you know, Dr. Sullivan, when we get together at lunch, we do it for social reasons too. We want to be, so we're going to make sure that we create some way of them socializing without breaking those, those rules. And that will be, uh, That'll be some of our work before school starts for sure. And those rules might be different. They probably will be different for ninth graders than they would for 12th graders. For sure. You know. For sure. Except we are going to have to, for everyone, we're going to have to think about the CDC guidelines. But Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah I just right. meant like where you can go. Oh, yeah. No, no question. Um, and the cleaning protocols will be followed very stringently no matter where we are. And that will, will also impact allergies and, uh, and that. We're, we're going to do a lot of training on that if we have that at the high school. Um, how will you support those teachers and therefore students in their classes that are not comfortable with delivering online education? Um, Dr. Collins, you want to talk about that a little bit? Just get on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Couldn't find it. I was looking at the questions. Um, so we are providing professional development for teachers. Obviously, everyone has a different comfort level when it comes to technology and teaching remotely. It's, it's new for, for so many. So um, we have um, several professional development opportunities that we will have for teachers while they're going to get an overview of what remote learning looks like. Also some additional Google training for a Google Classroom, um, as well as how to design curriculum and how to design lessons so that they're engaging for students with, you know, in a remote world. So um, we'll do those in the beginning of the year and then um, we will continue to do those um, throughout the year. Yep. And that's where we're committed to that. And as I said on that slide, um, that's a, that's a big part of our, of our professional development pledge to them. Um, a question about CPS looking into tutoring to support kids outside of school. We, we are, so we're, we realize, and I, I can test to this, I mean, as a parent and having some great teachers out of in a neighboring town, uh, it still was a big responsibility on, on me and on my, my wife and uh, to try to have our students kind of connected. My kids are younger than the high school level, but um, we are looking at ways to help facilitate more synchronous learning. Uh, obviously, Principal Scott's model attends to that more so than the other other uh, schools, but we are looking at that and that could be part of what we put our um, our funding towards. Is there flexibility with schedules with families with middle school and high school students so they can be in the building at the same time rather than wind up on opposite weeks? I assume that's a um, that's a sibling thing. Again, I think Principal Scott addressed that. Um, there could be, but we're looking at the best model for our students. If we just start, decide to start the year remotely, do we have the, so I assume that's if a parent decides, do we have the option to start sending the kids in once we feel more comfortable with how the school is being run, numbers of cases, et cetera? Yeah, you, you will, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna really look at, you know, we need to try to create a firm model. I know that that's out there, that a lot of districts are locking people into a model. Um, I'm gonna ask that you make a, a, as firm decision as you can, thinking that this is how we may be for the rest of the year. But of course, as Principal Scott said, as things change, the state could come in and say, we all have to be remote. They could say, vaccine is here and we're gonna all go down and get it and we're gonna be back quickly. I don't see that happening really fast, but um, yeah, we'll, we'll be as flexible as we can, but we really do want you to think about for the purposes of us planning, uh, what model is best for your son or daughter. Yeah. 
Right. And just to give you an example, you know, everything we do, we try to do individually. And, and that's why I like the size of Cohasset because you can kind of do that. So you might have someone who, you know, has thrived uh, remotely because some of our, our school anxious kids really did a nice job. And all of a sudden they say, well, geez, can I come in this week? Maybe, but let me look at what that does to the numbers of kids in the room. You know, because if you tip us over that, you know, 12 kid capacity, I want to try to make that work, but I got to kind of look at, at how that's going to impact everything else. So, you know, there's a, it's not just, you know, there's just a lot of moving parts. So, you know, but we do want to make it, the whole point is that we want to make it as flexible and fluid for people as, um, as the needs arise. Mm -hmm. Question about HVAC and ventilation. And yeah, we're looking into that. We're making sure that we articulate to everyone um, regarding uh, our ratings and where we are with ventilation and, we are concerned with, with heat and making sure that we cool areas that you know could have been passable before but won't be in this in this coming time. A question about if a family decides to strictly do remote, can that change as we said that in school year? Um, this is good. When there's overlap, we know it's a big concern, and that's a good thing for us at this point. Uh, how does or does the six weeks of social emotional learning compare to pre-pandemic schedule? And how whether to what extent does this six-week period take the place of issues topics that would have been taught otherwise. Put another way, what if any impacts does this have on what they may not learn? Uh, I think, I don't think it's one or the other. Yeah, I don't so I think this, the, there's classes start and then there's this ramp up to getting everybody on board. So just like you would envision like, let's say a college orientation, you don't show up and go into class and, and things start and then you're just in it. You got to figure out, you know, what the schedule looks like, you know, who your roommates are, uh, how to get to the cafeteria. We have all kinds of safety training that we're going to have to do with kids. We're going to have to almost kind of socialize them into being in this environment and, and showing them what it looks like. So that's, it's not a, it's not a soft start. It's, it's really kind of a ramp up to say like, all right, let's start with small groups and small instruction, orient kids there in the first couple of days. Then let's, that's, like layer that by being in touch with families, by doing a lot of social emotional work in addition to, or complementary with the classes. That's right. Then we're in it because then we're prepared, you know, and it's just like, you know, major league baseball doesn't just start games right now. They need a preseason in this model. We need a preseason. Yeah. And keep in mind, you know, one of the things that I'm really proud of, of uh, principal Scott and his team is that they've improved and raised the level of student voice significantly uh, over the past year. And uh, that needs to continue. You know, we really need to, and that's part of social emotional learning is um, social awareness, you know, letting students uh, be aware of what's around them and to be able to talk about it and to be able to have some voice in how the school's moving and running. And um, you can anticipate more of that coming your way. There's a little sub question that says, will you require students to have their camera on to be marked as an attending present? Um, someone's more thinking. I, I would think you'd have to be as fully engaged as the um, as the teacher would require, correct, Brian? Yeah, you know, I, 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 my initial, was, I, so I guess my answer to that is we're going to need to develop some best practices for remote learning. I could envision a scenario where a kid doesn't want his face on camera, but if that kid's physically present in the class and the teacher has eyes on that person, that I, I would allow that kid as a teacher, for me personally, and I'm not saying everybody would, to potentially shut your camera. You know, because there are some kids who are just really anxious about seeing themselves on, on camera um, or having everybody feel like, you're, you know, you're being looked at. So I'd be willing to, you know, kind of negotiate what that looks like with different kids and different teachers, but uh, we don't have a firm answer on it just yet. Nice. Um, this is a question about drop-offs in the morning, and I believe this goes back to, um, I would say, you know, obviously, <laughs> taking you pre-pandemic, we, we had a change anyway. We had a change in our start times, and we did pledge that there'll be some before-school offerings for folks. Um, and uh, Dr. Scrollins, do you want to comment on that at all? Uh, we are working with the Recreation Department, um, Director Ted Carroll, to provide um, and this was happening before COVID, um, but we were going into collaboration with them to create a before and after school program for elementary and also looking at um, uh, that drop off time in the morning for families for students at the middle and high school. So we are still continuing to work with 
the recreation department to be able to provide that um, mm -hmm. because at that we were also being um, providing lunch so that I mean some breakfast so as a grab and go so we'll still continue to do that because we know yes. we need it. I really we're in the process now of um, can just working the particulars out as we are with everything. Right. So that, that's in the plan. From a practical perspective, you know, we're going to have a lot more car traffic. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we have the main entrance where, you know, the main entrance to the hill and then the entrance towards the athletic fields. The, the hill is going to be a middle school entrance right. now. So not that you know, if you had kids in both, you couldn't drop them off at the circle. But splitting kids by nine and 12 gets most of the drivers in one parking lot and most of the parents up the hill and kind of minimizes that overflow on the pond street. So that was another consideration. That's right. And we are gonna, at this point, um, we are going to have folks who drop off for both, um, do so at the back in the, um, by the gymnasium. A lot of thank yous here. I'm not gonna read them, but I, nice for you leaders to see. Um, mm -hmm. And then, uh, can you also potentially have a process or a contact that the students can reach out to while they dialogue remotely, but are having issues with the Zoom password or getting to Zoom? Once the teacher is teaching, I'm not sure they can handle Yeah. So yeah, so we're looking at that. That was a uh, one of the items listed, um, a tech support uh, or um, what we would call remote tutors uh, um, could potentially be part of our plan. We are looking at that and we're seeing that if we can work around for that. So um, nothing confirmed yet, but that's a real, real strong thought. Will there be any effect on class scheduling or will it be status quo? Um, um, what do you think? It depends. So I think, you know, I can't, it, it really depends on how this whole thing plays out. So, you know, for example, we just got guidance on, you know, band and chorus and, and PE. And, you know, we might have to change the models of those classes depending on whether or not the restrictions are practical. Um, you know, if everybody's gonna wear a mask indoors, I don't know that you were using the fitness center without hyperventilating. So, you know, we might have to change what we do. Mm -hmm. I don't see a ton of movement, but I do think that we'll have to pay attention to whether or not the, the schedules that were built in, well, still aren't built, but that were chosen in the spring are still practical. And we're working on a couple of other, you know, creative solutions. We got a grant from the CEF um, for, a, it's not a virtual course, but it's a course that can be accessed asynchronously and remotely uh, that's a science course in conjunction with CSCR. So it's premature to announce exactly what that looks like because I, I have Jack Buckley coming up with the, uh, the, the details, but that's something that we're looking to try to roll out in the first, it might not be right away, but it might be hopefully in the first half of the year so that we have a couple of options for kids who um, might need to shuffle some things around. Yep. Uh, what is the line of communication when someone is in the testing process for COVID with the two week recommendation of quarantine for all who come in contact with a potential exposure, what will happen when someone says they are sick? So I should say in the guidance, yeah, I'm sorry, the guidance from the CDC slash state is all in the document and some of the protocols, I just happen to have it opened here, our um, student and staff test positive for COVID-19, the protocol for close contact of a student and staff test positive for COVID-19, Student is symptomatic on the bus, student is symptomatic at school, staff is symptomatic at home, staff is symptomatic at school, um, presence of multiple cases in the schools or district. There's every protocol that, you know, well, not, I'm sure there are others, but uh, essentially the, the line of communication for us is obviously through our public health agents, or if it isn't, I should say, it is through our public health agents. So we um, will be working with um, a process we do have uh, sick rooms or isolation rooms that will be separated from uh, a place where a kid might go if they he, he or she scraped his knee or her knee or whatever it is. And um, we would have isolation process involved, try to get the student dismissed. Um, there's an important role of the parent in all of this. And we're really going to ask you, we don't at this point believe we're going to be screening kids as they come into the building. That was not the recommended um, guidance to us. And it also is a lot of uh, false positives, false negatives with that. Um, but we are going to be working to discern, uh, you know, if a kid's not feeling well and, and isolating them and then having them get tested. There will be all kinds of situations I know where students will be staying home. And that's why in this model at the high school, the flexibility of moving to a remote 
is something they can do if they're well enough to do it. If they're not and they're ill, then they're sick. That's another matter. And uh, there are protocols, as you articulated in the question, around someone who is quarantined um, because they are um, indeed uh, have COVID. And then there's someone who is, uh, uh, has been deemed a, a close contact. And then there's, there's uh, procedures in there regarding people who are um, symptomatic, but we don't know yet if they have it and they're waiting for a test to come in. So all of that will be followed and we're gonna take very close guidance from our public health agents and our lead nurse in the district uh, and make sure we have protocols for all of that. And I'll just say again, you know, knock on wood, times change, but our rates are low here right now in Cohasset. And I think the best thing we can do is to keep behaving in ways, and I put me in this as well, that allow us to have our rates low. It's a crucial thing for us. Um, Cohasset is already starting later than some districts, starting after Labor Day. Yep. I'm concerned with the 10 extra days that the department had just gave. Uh, if we don't start until late in September, my concern is that it will fall winter. We have to shut down due to a spike. We may have compressed the learning time compared to others. Yep, I, I share your concerns. Um, the guidance says that if, stu if schools are able to start um, September 16th, that that would be the latest we go unless they do a waiver. And I, I share some of your concerns here. These are things that we will have to negotiate and talk to the association about. Um, and we're working that through. And um, yeah, I, I, had, I had thought up until a couple of days ago that the eighth starting date was a very good thing um, because it gave us more time. Um, I'm not sure it, it, it will be a bad thing that we have to go a little later than that. Uh, I do anticipate we will, but I do agree with you going too deeply into September uh, could be problematic for us. Uh, we but do, again, but with everybody, Ahead, Starting on the 16th, you know, in my mind, that's only six days where the kids would be in as opposed to 10. Um, those extra four days are being picked up before by the teachers. Well, hope, I hope. Yep. And those are things that we'll have to negotiate and talk to them about if that's the, that's the process. So we are concerned going deeper than the 16th, however. Uh, how will the student drop off, traffic flow, logistics be changed? We, we talked about that, but no buses. Will students be allowed to enter the building earlier? We talked about that a little bit. We will have more supervision, I'm hoping, um, at the front of the building. Since you are teaching all remote and the kids in the building may even be learning remotely, what's the benefit of sending my student outside of seeing friends? Well, go ahead, Brian, I, I have an answer I mean, to it as well. I, honestly, that's the, that's the chief argument for taking the risk of bringing everyone back in. You know, there are still a lot of businesses that aren't going, you know, fully in person for a long time. Um, and so, you know, our, our hope is that kids social emotional development and, um, you know, those relationships are better in person with peers um, than, you know, potentially at home. But that's certainly a family decision. And if people want to do that, um, you know, we, we can accommodate for that. Yeah, it is. And I, I would, um, I, I would really argue that I, I think there's a huge benefit to if we can safely, I don't think Brian's saying the opposite, but if we can have people in the building, having them in the building, you know, I, I know the effect that it can take on a, um, <clears throat> on a child being so detached from the normalized routines um, throughout the whole, the whole gamut of, of our education. And you know, nothing will ever substitute a person-to-person -person, uh, communication from one of our amazing teachers to our kids. So um, that's the big benefit. But we do, we are trying to be, as Brian and I just mentioned, nimble. <laughs> and so we're going to figure out ways to, to attend to every scenario that come our way. Um, but I really hope that we get been, that. You know, if you, anybody, and you can judge this by your own experience, anybody who looks back to what they did in high school, I guarantee, well, my thought, my feeling is that no one really remembers the stuff. You know, we don't remember what the bio lessons were. We don't remember what our grades were, but we remember, you know, a bunch of friends. We remember, you know, great conversations with teachers. You know, we remember laughing and doing all that stuff. And, you know, I think that's what they need to get back to. Okay. We are, so we're at 7.03. I'll go a little longer, um, just a few more minutes. But again, we're, we, could, we could go for four hours and we're not going to scoop them all up, but this has been helpful and hopefully you're getting some answers to some of the questions that you have and you can continue that um, by sending us if you need to. Um, what will happen with team sports? 
We don't know yet. Uh, we we have received some guidance that potentially preseason will be starting no earlier than September 14th for those sports that are deemed, uh, I guess, for lack of a better word, safe to to participate in in the uh, in the fall. But we're awaiting that guidance. It's um, it's not here. So I don't know how else to say that. It's just not here yet. Um, for dual working parent families who work outside of the home, not having students in different schools in the same schedule, not having a bus option is a major hardship, especially since we both leave for work, school starts. Will district have any option to help us? Um, at this point, I don't think so. I'll just be, I, I, we're, we're, nothing is sealed and delivered, but our buses are such a conundrum for us, even to try to fit the kids in elementary for the hybrid model is a push. Uh, so I, I think outside of the law that we have to follow, and that's the advice coming down from the commissioner, I, I'm not sure we're gonna be able to afford much flexibility in that. Um, question about the schedule, a word in for the, the grading division, someone likes that. Uh, on the streaming solution option, we talked, to, oh, on the streaming solution option, doesn't that have to be ready for the start of school? Uh, whether we have in person or not, just want to make sure that whatever option is decided are being reviewed. There's enough time between now and September to roll that out. Otherwise, what happens then? Yep, any solution that we we decide on, we'll be able to roll out fairly quickly. I don't think it's going to be intensely complex. Um, how will power outages in, in the part of the town be addressed for remote? Well, that will be a problem. If we have a power outage, I, I think it would be just like we have for a uh, you know, a snow day or whatever it might be, we'd have to <clears throat> suspend assignments at that point. Um, you know, and then when we can communicate, we will, and uh, we'll have to do the best we can with that. Uh, it, it will certainly be a problem if it, if it happens, and we'll just have to to problem solve it as we get to it. Uh, for parents who have middle school and high school kids, I understand you cannot move the high school grouping. However, if the sixth, eighth graders are cohorts, I think you should consider allowing the middle school student to switch. So right now we're looking at an alphabetical division <clears throat> by middle school. So that might not play into that. And you can tune in tomorrow night, talk about that if you like, and Pitzel Mills will talk a little more about that. Um, okay. Oh yeah, we gotta, hold on, snow days can be an important release. Having to be remote while it's snowing out is such a, a bad thing for kids. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I understand. I like my I like a snow day too, but we're just trying to keep the continuance of learning. That's that's sort of our goals always. You know, we begrudgingly embrace snow days and we have to, but I, we want to educate. That's what we do. But I hear that. Um, thank you for your compliments. Nice job. Now take a couple of moments here. Take two more questions. Um, regarding heat indexes in classrooms, are you exploring AC in the high school rooms. Um, we're we're going to look at that. Uh, what what's attainable and what isn't, and we're really going to look. We're, we are looking into that. Yeah. And then there's a question about mask breaks. Well, the commissioners come down uh, to say that there'll be at least two mask breaks per day. We know that, and we anticipate more. And I anticipate a couple of type of mask breaks. And Brian, interrupt me if you think I'm not correct here for the high school. But you're going to have mask breaks that are prescribed. And then you're going to have mass breaks that are needed. And we're going to have to figure out a way to allow our students to do both because it, it, it's going to be tough at times for them. And yeah, the heat would certainly make that an impossibility in some contexts. So we're going to, we're going to be very mindful of that. And if we can go outside and that's a better scenario, it might be better, but if it's really hot, probably not. So we're going to have to really think that through. That's a new one for all of us. Um, okay. I see a lot of repetition on some of them. Okay, this, this is an important one. Two very diverse questions. Number one, what is the plan to make sure students with an IEP are properly supported? Barbara, you finally have a chance, question that you can, you can answer here. <laughs> what is the plan to make sure students with an IEP are properly supported? And of course, Brian, you can add on to it. So absolutely, um, you know, again, kind of reiterating what was said before um, this spring, you know, we kind of all did the best we could in pandemic learning. I know that IEP services really looked like 
resources and supports. It's very clear from the commissioner this time that IEP services are going to be fully delivered and that the plans are truly going to be learning and service plans. So we are committed to delivering those IEP services. Some of them may be in person, some of them may be synchronous, some of them may be asynchronous and remote, but we are going to make sure that all of the students on IEPs receive what is in their service delivery grid. Okay, and the next question was actually answered. So I'll just keep going. Last question here. Um, they're all great questions. We're, we got through more, you should be proud of Brian, you got through more than Principal Sullivan did the other day. Um, we get so far you get the award. No, she did a great job too. But um, let's see, a lot of things about sports. I see one about MCAS. I'll just give you, as of right now, um, the state is saying that there will be MCAS, but there'll be future guidance. Um, but that was the latest that we received. Yeah, and then a lot of really positive things. Um, last question, Brian, I guess, not that it's the, <laughs> the best question at the end, but it's a good one. Um, there's a question about exams. How do we handle exams? Will each half a class take it different when weeks, weeks when in person or at school? Do you have a new approach? For remote exams. Have you thought that through yet? I know that's yeah well up. yeah I mean part you know so like there's like how it works in my mind and there's how it works in reality um, and you know what, what teachers can do relatively adeptly they're going to require some training especially some folks but we have the in-house knowledge base is to do what's called a flipped classroom so you know you're having kids learn um, and then come in for um, in-person help right but that requires that everybody is remote and everybody is in. So, you know, if you were gonna do a, a paper and pencil test, for example, if everybody was in that, that week, that's when I would do it. But the reality is that isn't the way it's gonna work. Um, and so we really need to rethink how our assessment works, um, you know, how projects are developed authentically, how we prevent kids from cheating, because I'll just be honest, it was rampant. Um, and, and I don't think any kid would tell you differently. So we really need to kind of rethink that. That's gonna be a lot of work. Um, and you know, ultimately we wanna know what kids are, what they know and what they're able to do. And we need to put our heads together as departments and, and peer teachers to figure out the best way to do that. Brian, any, um, late, any thoughts on the late start time having any effect on seniors doing college prep for college apps? No, I don't think so. I mean, every, Seniors are supposed to come in with the college essay, you know, um, Mr. McKay will start with that. And then our guidance focus really is college heavy up front. So I was just talking to Laura Struzieri today. We hired another um, half position in guidance. So, um, you know, we'll have two full-time counselors and, and Ms. Struzieri will kind of oversee them. And, and we can direct some resources to really make sure that, that we put her and Mr. McGowan who know these seniors in front of them, working with them, take this other person who's new, have them do some of the other workshops. So we're still kind of working out the particulars of that, but it's very much a um, you know, conversation. I, you know, depending on whether kids are going early and what you know, colleges do in terms of changing the dates, this past year they changed dates left and right and everybody was doing it a little bit differently. So my hunch is that they're gonna push things back a little bit as they figure out what their admissions needs are. Um, I don't know that for sure, but yeah, I mean, it, all, all hands will be on deck for, for our seniors for sure. Okay, well, I'm gonna conclude at that point, at that, with that uh, thought, and um, I just wanna say that we're very excited for graduation. I'm really um, impressed by the work that Principal Scott and team have done preparing for that, and I hope to see uh, many of you there. That's coming up um, next Friday. It's, it's, it's coming so fast, it's like, uh, it was so far away, and now it's like here, but, um, we're excited for that and uh, very proud to be part of the class community. So thank you all and um, have a great night.